without further ado, I want to introduce you to Ra Raquel. And I have a little thing I'm going to read to you. And she has been just so excited all day long to get to this moment, as we did last year. And it's so great to be here again. What is Cuban cuisine? A delectable intermingling of Spanish, Portuguese, Arabian, Chinese, African culinary traditions, a true melting pot of all the influences that combine in Cuban culture. Now, Raquel gives us the definitive book on Cuban cuisine, encyclopedic in its range, but intimate and accessible in tone. Ooh, did you write that? Yes. That was really nice. <laughs> with more than 500 recipes for classic home-style dishes, as well as the vividly told stories behind the recipe, which is always the best part of the recipe, is the story behind it, because I think there's a story behind every single one of them. Based on her family recipes, this is a real Cuban cooking presented with today's busy cooks in mind. When I moved here from Kentucky, her books have been part of my library to help me immerse in the cuisines of South Florida. It was, as I moved here, these are the books that I started to truly learn about all of the ingredients and techniques that were somewhat unfamiliar to me. And now I can't wait to add this one to the library as well. Everybody, please put your hands together and welcome Raquel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am totally humbled to be here, first of all, because this is a professional kitchen. I feel like running out right now because basically I am not a chef. I am not a cook. At most, I'm an ac accidental cook at home. I'm really clumsy around the kitchen. But I, I'm very passionate about a couple of things. One of the things is I'm, I'm very, very passionate about books and book selling. It's been my entire life. I have been a bookseller for 47 years. And because of book selling, that's where my love of cookbooks came out, and also my love to record the recipes that are Cuban, that are of my heritage. I wanted to record those traditional recipes, which had really were not recorded, even though there's a very famous chef in Cuba, Nitsa Villapol, and I know some of you will recognize her name. And she was like the Julia Child of Cuba. She was on TV every night. And that's who I remember as a kid. When we came to the States, I came when I was 11 in 1965, and we went right into book selling, my whole family. We started, you know, my dad and I started in the bookstore noticing that people were coming in asking for, do you have Nita Villapol's book or any kind of cookbook, Cuban cookbook? At first, they asked for it in Spanish. As time went on, they wanted it in English because their kids were growing up and they wanted to give it to their daughter or to their son or they wanted to cook together with their kids. So that's really where the love of the book came out. I, uh, we, my dad and I um, started collecting recipes from our friends, from our families, actually from many restaurants, and really because we wanted to record those traditional Cuban recipes. We're talking about maybe that was 18 years ago. As time went on, we did what most booksellers do, which is, OK, let's self-publish the book and distribute it on our own in Miami, which we did. Worked out really well. We did it with magazines. You know, we would put it in magazines. We would do all kinds of things. But we saw that there was such a need that that's when I went ahead and I said, I need an agent. And I got myself an agent, and she's here somewhere. And she was the one that was able to, even though I've been in the industry all my life, she was the one that was able to sell my recipes and my content to Vintage, which is a really great publishing company. So I was very happy to do that. When the, and that was all in Spanish. When the Spanish version came out, which was this one, uh, once again, we had that question of where is the book in English and how have, actually, how have the res recipes metamorphed? How have they changed in exile? What has, where's the fusion at? So those are all the questions that I, when I went to translate my book in Spanish, I went ahead and I, and I feel so comfortable in English, actually, that I went ahead and almost wrote a whole new book. And I also added a few chapters that I thought were important such as I added Cuban baby food, because we all know that if we're Cubans, even though we're working and we're Cuban Americans, we want our kids to have that homemade, organic puree, which, and I have a whole chapter on it. I also did something on Cuban candy, because I thought it was so neat and so unique. I did a lot on Cuban ice cream. I did something on uh, smoothies, batidos, appetizers. And I also did a chapter, because I believe that is 
the progress to have a sustainable uh, cuisine. I also did a chapter on light Cuban cooking and how we can make it healthier. So that's what I did as a bookseller. As a cook, I didn't do much except have people kitchen test. I even went ahead and uh, actually hired somebody that of all things worked at Flanagan's and I said, you know, take these recipes, kitchen test them and tell me what you think. And I had a lot of feedback and, and the feedback from him a lot was Raquel, you know, I'm not Cuban, I don't understand this, so change it. So that's how, that was the process of my book. And um, now what I, what I wanted to do, and because I do work for booksellers, I, I'm a partner and I work for Books and Books, so I brought who I believe is the guy that's been feeding me for the last couple of years, it is the chef, Chef Papo, at Books and Books. Now, Chef has one thing going against him. He's not really Cuban, he's Puerto Rican, but, but, but he has really, um, you know, he's, he's actually changed a couple of my recipes to the best. We've done a couple of things at Books and Books and it's worked out really well. Today, he wanted to, to arroz con pollo, which is the ultimate comfort food, basically for anybody, which is chicken and rice. We usually do it at La Chorrera, which is very runny, but for the purpose of tonight, we went ahead and, and, and did an arroz con pollo. We also are doing a black bean hummus, and we are going to do what I call the Cuban smoothie, which is just a, a milkshake of tropical fruits. And now with further ado, I want to know what we're doing so I can ex explain it to you. Okay, we're starting with a black bean hummus. Okay, let me go ahead and, and give them a little bit of the recipe. Okay, the black bean hummus on pita bread. Let me get my glasses. Sorry, I'm so clumsy about this. This kitchen is awesome. <laughs> Anyways, um, the hummus, you know, it's something because hummus is something that we eat all the time now. It's part of our new trendy food. It's something that I know at Books and Books is our most popular item. Well, we decided to do it with black bean because of, of the, the Cuban. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the first thing we need is two cups of drained black bean soup, okay, and a tablespoon of tahini. We're going to go ahead and add olive oil, lime juice, garlic clove, minced, and then that's about it. In a food processor, we combine all the ingredients and process until thoroughly mixed and smooth. We cover, we chill, we remove it, and then we spread it on whatever we want. That, I know it's a very basic recipe, but that is the basic be uh, recipe for black bean hummus, and it's actually very delicious. You see him putting the tahini, lemon, lemon just a little bit of water, and this is the way we do it at Books and Books, and our hummus is really famous at Books and Books, by the way. I know. Chef Papo likes to add. Yeah, Chef Papo likes to add Chef Papo to all the dishes at uh, at Books and Books when we put him a special. So this is Chef Papo's black bean hummus. We're processing. It. Yeah, it's a very simple dish. It's also not a traditional Cuban recipe. But once again, it's one of the things that I wanted to do in the book is to add and to see what kind of variations and what kind of fusions were going on in our, in our cooking. While he's doing this, I, I have to really commend this Culinary Institute. It, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. I, I'm seeing this is probably the most, I'm downtown all the time, and this is probably the most alive I have ever seen Miami-Dade College. It's just wonderful to be walking down the streets of downtown Miami and seeing, you know, chefs walking up and down. It's just such an exciting thing. And, and, I, and I think that the time will come when the Culinary Institute will have a four-year bachelor's degree in culinary management, which is really something we need here in South Florida. Okay. Ya tenemos el black bean hummus ready. The black bean hummus is ready. Okay. And should we go ahead and give it to try out? Now, the chicken and rice, like I said, we brought some in already done, but we're going to show you the, you know, the steps of going in. But it's, it's, most of the Cuban recipes are really, really very simple. One of the things that I, I, I think people get mixed up about, not here in Miami, because here in Miami we eat Cuban 24-7, and we know, but outside of Miami people think that Cuban food is very spicy, and it's not spicy at all. 
And I think the other thing that we need to look at as, as having a sustainable cuisine and having a sustainable cuisine for the future is that we use so many root vegetables in our okay, cuisine. Okay, we're going to start with the chicken and rice creole. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, read you a little bit of the introduction. He's, he's, he's starting our little sofrito. And sofrito is basically the base for our Cuban cooking as well as for many other Latin American cookings. He's, let me go ahead and give you some of the, of the ingredients. Of course, the skinless chicken breast, the tablespoon of vegetable oil. Then we, what he's making right now, homemade, is the sofrito. Uh, we do use some ham. In this case, Papo used chorizo because we thought it'd be cooler. Bay leaves, salt and pepper, oregano. I myself like to add beer instead of water, but that's to your taste. And of course, we do use the short grain Valencia rice, saffron to taste, or the little uh, yellow behold, which is super cheap compared to saffron, chicken stock of consomme, and then we can garnish however we please. Arroz con pollo, or chicken and rice creole, um, you know, it really started in the like Cuba 1900, let's say. Imagine this epoch. Elegant Cuba at the turn, last turn, at the turn of the last century. Uh, that was when this dish originated. Chicken and rice can still be found at banquets, weddings, Sunday suppers, and most of our heartwarming occasions. It makes an excellent party or buffet dish because of its durability, we brought it over, and flexibility in the way it lends itself to elegant and actually to colorful garnishing, which is why we do it for most birthday parties and for our Sunday suppers. This is one of the favorite recipes, so we urge you to start a new family tradition. To make it a la chorrera, it means to make it really runny and soupy. Uh, you can make it as runny or as fluffy as you'd like, and that has to do with the liquid you put in, whether it's a beer, the, you know, sometimes we put wine or vino seco, dry white wine. And that's how you manage the consistency with the amount of liquid. And you guys got to tell me how that black bean hummus is. Of course, in the usual, what is it? We started with the sofrito, we put the rice and we're putting it, you know, to, we add the water or the beer. We add the bay leaves, the salt, the pepper, the oregano, and we bring it to a boil. Right at the boiling point, Lower heat, cover, and allow to cook slowly for about 15 minutes. So add the saffron, then add the brown chicken. This is also the time, of course, to decide how much more liquid you'd like to do in order to do it a la chorrera, very runny, or to do it nice and dry like we did it here for tasting purposes. Cook over, um, you know, medium-low heat for about another 20 minutes. You may garnish however you'd like. Uh, this is a very simple recipe. Um, I read it right off because it took me so long uh, as a writer to visualize how to do this recipe step by step because one of the things that we haven't talked about is most cookbooks do not have pictures or illustrations because it makes it very expensive. Because mine is such an ethnic and such a closed type of book, there were not going to be any pictures or anything in color, so you could see either what the dish would look at at the end or the ingredients, etc. So that's why it was so important to me, and my editor made sure that I knew that each step had to be one by one, and I actually had to visualize it. And, and that's how I kind of learned the magic of recipe writing, which is very different to watching somebody do it because he does it by instinct and I actually had to think about it when I was writing it step by step by step and then read it to somebody that was going to do it and uh, that's how the recipe came about. This is the arroz con pollo that we brought because chef woke up super early today on his day off to do this favor for me and he made the chicken and rice in his house. Yeah, this is the way that we're doing it, of course. This is, and I, I'm sure you can see all this. This is, it's already boiling in order to put the, the rice in and to start it. But it would take about 45 minutes, which we really don't have here. That's why we're just heating this up here. And this is the way that it should come out. Si lo cogen, si lo cogen, lo hierven, lo, 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 lo esmechen, mm -hmm. el arroz le va a quedar mucho, mucho más mejor que cortarlo y echarlo en pedazos grandes. No, te, I didn't get you. Okay. Si ellos cogen el, 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 el pollo, lo, lo ripean. Okay. 
Chef likes for his arroz con pollo to, uh, first of all, not have the bones and to be ripped before you mix it. I myself like to use boned in chicken because I think that the bone gives it a lot more flavor at the beginning, but that's what I'm doing at my house and on my own. And sometimes, actually, I do it on the pressure cooker, which is a wonderful way uh, to cook chicken and rice and to cook many other Cuban dishes. And I don't know if any of you remember, but I remember in my household, my grandmothers would have like three pressure cookers cooking at the same time, and they were like doing a little song and dance, and, and that's something that I took back with me. And I also, in this book, I did a whole chapter on just cooking on your pressure cooker. That's what I was just telling him. He likes it both ways, and, but for ease, and actually, if you're doing restaurants or if you're doing catering, it is better to use boneless chicken. Where we, so how was the black bean hummus? Did everybody like it? Good? And it's so simple. And I have to confess, we were going to do the black bean soup at home and soak the beans overnight. I didn't have time to do it. And I told Papo not to go ahead and do it. And we actually used canned black beans. And you know what? That's what you can do at home. And it's fine. Yeah, he's, Papa wants you to go by and visit Books and Books and visit his cafe so you can see. And I know all of you have gone by there. And I, I just want you guys to enjoy the fair. Yeah. Well, uh, the, he is the cook, he is the chef at the, at the Gables. We have another chef who also has a book, Bernie, Chef Bernie, who's like a Bernie, Cuban, Bernie, almost vegan, and, and that's very interesting because I'm thinking that he has a book in his head that I need to draw out. <laughs> but he is our chef at, uh, at the Lincoln Road Books and Books. There are many variations in my book to the chicken and rice, and I'm sure you do too. I have a creamed one. I have another one that's very popular called arroz imperial, which is baked with cheese and actually with a layer of mayonnaise and ham in the middle. And it's also one of those foods that you can do as a party. Like I said, that's a baptism, a birthday party kind of food. I told them that you use the jamón and, and the chorizo. And this is basically, you know, the paella recipe and basically any kind of, you know, rice with something else. I mean, we, I have an entire chapter called Rice Goes With Everything because, you know, Cuban food has a lot of rice in it and most of our meals do carry a lot of rice as well as Cuban meals usually have some type of plantain, whether it's green plantain or the ripe, you know, platanos maduro. So I did an entire chapter just on plantains. Are we ready for the milkshake or todavía? The ice? That's a great point. Most, by the way, did you know that Publix has a Hispanic branch now called Sabor? And it's, uh, they have, I think, five in Florida. And they have one in Hialeah, of course. But they have one in Westchester, of course. And they have one out in North. And it's called Sabor. And they basically have reduced their stock to put most of the Hispanic theme or things that you can use in Hispanic recipes. Most of these ingredients are available at, if we're in Miami, they're available everywhere. If we're out of Miami, they would be in an ethnic uh, aisle in your supermarket. They're also available online. In my book, I put a little online resource. There is a place, he, uh, it's, it's actually based here, their brick and mortar store, but they're online. It's called Sentir Cubano. And if you look up cubanfoodmarket.com, they have all the ingredients that you can order online and they'll ship them to you. They also have even like pastelitos already made that you just have to heat up. Like if you're in New York and you're, you're in dire need of a pastelito, you can order it online. Um, so I did put in the back, um, you know, a resource center when you, where you can find most of the, I mean, I've got things like Amigo Foods, Broadway Panhandler in New York, and by the way, New York is a very big place to have Cuban restaurants. I know Victor's Cafe actually gave me their recipe. They called me up. They said, We're, you know, we hear you're doing a Cuban cookbook. We would like to donate to you the black bean. Yeah, it's really cool, the black bean, as long as you tell our story of how we came into exile. So you will find in my book, I do a lot of, okay, this dish should be like this, da-da-da-da, you know, cook 
inspired in the introduction, but I also tried to do an oral history, not so much of where the dish came from, even though I did do that. A lot of it is just what nostalgic things bring back to you. And um, I think with Victor's Cafe, he, he, he wrote me a beautiful story about the lines in front of his restaurant when he opened. So I kind of wrote that in. I shortened it, of course, but I tried to, to, to write the, the real nostalgic story. Okay, we're ready for our milkshake. No, we're gonna do we're gonna do the batido, not with milk. Even though we do a lot of batidos, you know, Cubans love to have condensed milk, evaporated milk, and regular milk in their same batido. But we are trying to go a healthier route. Hispanics, as well as older people, our generations are getting older. We're having a lot of problems with diabetes and a lot of other, you know, obesity problems. And uh, you know, I, I feel I almost feel a responsibility to start changing the recipes a little bit around and say, why don't you use this instead of this? Okay, we put four strawberries in, one banana, pineapple, just because it's tropical. A Are all of us here amateur cooks, or do we have professionals here in the audience? ¿Qué es eso? Okay, that's the pulp, the papaya pulp. As you know, we can get pulp anywhere frozen in most supermarkets. I don't know if in your in your Publix or in yeah, you go by and you see pulp of papaya, mango, and you can use it for a milkshake as well. I actually that's what I use. A little bit of ice, right? Okay. Some water, just to make it a little runnier. Yeah, I, I just told I just told them, Papa. We Cubans like to do. We would be adding condensed milk, evaporated milk, and regular milk to that. So we have, while we're waiting, does anybody have any questions or anything you would like to talk about? Don't over rotate it so it's a little bit, it's got some texture. But of course, that all depends on the taste. I know my kids love it super runny. Yeah, we didn't put sugar, we didn't put anything, but this is completely natural. Okay, let's, mira, you can And what's going on in here? I don't know if you, can you guys see this? Yeah, in, in there, this is where we started. We didn't continue cooking it because we have the whole cooked thing. But it, it's just, it's turning into that, that would just take about 45 minutes. You can do it in this, you can do it in a pressure cooker, you can do it. Many people like to do it baked. Yeah, yeah. His, you know, his, his cooking 101 rule is use your stock, that if you're boiling a chicken or you're going to brown your chicken first, use that stock, use everything, and that, you know, that goes without saying. That, that's a... That's a, a great, because it just adds flavor. And I, I would like to, to really um, tell you guys to just experiment with your cooking. Uh, go back to your roots and experiment with your ethnicities and, you know, see, see what you can do in, in the kitchen or, you know, in, in, in just researching food. I mean, we have become such a food-oriented uh, hope. The good thing is it's not that we're eating more, but we're just learning a lot more about it. And, and I, and I think the key is to go into a future where we're sustainable and to go into a future where we just become a lot more organic and just a lot healthier. Um, that's something that we have to really inculcate into our children, into the new generation, because it's, it's all about health and it's all about healthy habits. So we really hope that you've enjoyed this little short trip that we've uh, done for you. So without further ado, that's it. All right. Thank you. Have a great time, guys. This program is brought to you by Miami Culinary Institute at Miami-Dade College. For more information about the schools and the culinarium program, 
please visit www.miamidadeculinary.com or call 305-237-3276.